Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called Stories of Jesus. It's our summer series. We're going through the Bible. We're doing an existential, an exegesis study of Scripture. We're going through a story, then we're breaking it down, looking at the hidden meetings, the hidden gems. We're saying to ourselves that we need to pay attention to the details, the way that Jesus did miracles, the way that people stepped out in faith and how they received what they were believing God for. The passage that kind of inspired this whole thing is John 21, 25, and it says, there are so many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written down one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books. And I thought to myself, man, Jesus did all that in three years of ministry. In my 27 years of ministry, have I done enough to fill a business card, let alone the world, with books? I began to think of us as Christians, as believers in Jesus who are banking our eternity on spending time with God, are we doing it now? Are we doing the works of Jesus today, or are we just believing in this eternal rest that one day we're going to go to heaven, but we really don't care about heaven now? Come on, think about that. Let that settle in for a moment. There's many, many miracles that Jesus performed. There's many healings. There's Different things that he did. We talked last week about Jesus walking on water. And in studying these things out, we need again to pay attention to the details. So today, we're going to look at Mark 7, verse 31. We're going to read it today in the Amplified translation. Amplified just basically means it amplifies the passage. It uses many of the same words for one uh, Greek word or one Hebrew word. Okay, And it says this, soon after this, Jesus coming back from the region of Tyre, passed through Sidon on the Sea of Galilee, through the region of Decapolis, uh, the ten cities. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had difficulty speaking. Now, we've seen that with people before, right? If someone is deaf they many times have a hard time speaking because they don't have the internal ear to hear themselves put together words. They may know what those words are, but to say them, they just kind of sound very strange. So he has this, right? It's it's just kind of common. They had difficulty speaking. And they begged Jesus to place his hands upon him and taking him aside from the crowd privately. First time we've seen that. He thrust his fingers in the man's ears and spat and touched his tongue. I just wondered today (laughs) if I could get away with some of this stuff. I wondered today if I had like a healing line, if I was like, bow, (laughs) wet willy somebody, (laughs) poo. Spit it in their face. I wonder if I could get away with that today. Huh? If you got healed, would you care? Okay, okay. It just looks strange to the onlooker. Spat on him, touched his tongue, and he looked to heaven. He sighed. He said, F, F, Afi, Afa. I don't know, it just sounds weird. Which means, be opened. He spoke this word specifically to this man's ears. He said, be opened. And his ears were open and his tongue was loosed. And he began to speak distinctly as he should. And Jesus, in his own interest, admonished and ordered them sternly, expressing, no one, like, listen, don't go tell anybody. Just chill out. But they were all overwhelmed and they didn't do what he said and, you know, story goes on. Let's take a look at this. Let's break this down. 
Mark 7, 32. And they brought him a man who was deaf and had difficulty speaking, and they begged Jesus to place his hands upon him. I love this because this man did not hear stories about Jesus. He's deaf. He did not hear about miracles of Jesus. But his friends did. His friends did. Right? I love the compassion that this man's friends had on him. Said, man, if, if the healer is in town, I got a friend. I got a friend who needs what's going on. I wonder if we have that same compassion and urgency in and of ourselves for our friends who don't yet know Jesus. I've got to introduce my friends to something that looks a little bit different than classic church, than classic Christianity. I've got somebody who needs what family church is doing, what Jesus is doing in the earth today. So this guy didn't hear about Jesus. His friends did. The people that he surrounded himself with or surrounded him did. And I'm just saying, it's important who you surround yourself with. It is important who your friends are. I'm going to give somebody a tip right now. Somebody, you got a friend who is like 100% neurotic. Everything that comes out of their mouth is negative. You need some distance. You need some distance. They are going to drag you down. They're going to make your life a living hell. You've got to get away from people like that. All right? Negativism is killing you. It's literally making your life worse being around negative people. It's important who you surround yourself with. It's said that you are the average of your closest five friends. The people that you surround yourself with the most. You're the average. Probably right in the middle. So, some people need to get some new friends. But I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make... Listen, go online and join a Facebook group. Find a, a common interest in something. Right? Dogs. Like you got a Shih Tzu. Join a Shih Tzu group. <laughs> On Facebook. Go find some friends. Go find people that you can get along with that are a little bit different than you. Find some friends that look different than you, that think different than you, that think differently about money than you. Come on, somebody. Have some friends that are richer than you. Have some friends that are poorer than you. Come on, I'm trying to help somebody today. It's important who you surround yourself with. These were people that he had around him, and they were expecting something from Jesus for him. I love that. They weren't being selfish. It wasn't just about them. It wasn't just what they could get from God. Oh, what about me? What's God going to do for me? Well, I'm not going to go to that service because there's nothing for me there. They said, no, I got a friend, though. My boy, my girl, they need what's there. I'm going to take them even if it's not for me. It matters who you have around, especially when you need something from God. Come on, I'm just gonna throw this out. Who in your life can you call, that's a friend, when you need prayer? Not just the person, listen, any of us have probably five friends that you can call and vent. Right? I mean, hey, listen, you got 9,000 Facebook friends that you vent. But who's going to throw down a prayer the moment you get them on the phone? Like, dude, I'm in it right now. I'm having a, yo, pray for me right now. Oh, yeah, I'm going to keep you in prayer. No, 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 right now. Right now, over the phone. Let me hear your voice. Let me connect in faith in this moment with somebody. And listen, Pastor John Mark can't do it all for everybody. It is important who you surround yourself with. So his friends, they either saw or they heard Jesus laying hands on people before because they're very specific and they say, Jesus, lay your hands on him. But I love Jesus. I love, Jesus is kind of like a smart aleck. He's like, 
he's like a low-key smart aleck, right? He just doesn't, he don't say nothing, but he don't like getting put in a box. Come on, Lay hands on him. You're going to tell me how I'm going to heal this guy? You're going to tell me how to do my job? <laughs> and, All right, you want me to lay hands? <laughs> Bow. <laughs> I'll lay some hands. <laughs> like there's really no reason, there's no need for, like theologically, there's no reason for spit. <laughs> there was no reason for a loogie up in this situation. He did not have to do all that, right? It was, and it wasn't even for showmanship because he took him away privately, right? And then, hey, let's go away privately because I'm about to spit in your face. And I don't want to do that in front of your boys. <laughs> Come on. Mark 7, 33. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he thrust his fingers in the man's ears, spat, and touched his tongue. There was a large gathering of people present, and Jesus took this guy to the side. Here's what I want to point out. Here's what I want to point out. Get this. There are factors in the environment that can determine whether God is able to move in the lives of people or not. Sometimes you got to get away from unbelief. The power of God is present everywhere and it's available all the time. But there are some times when you're around the wrong people and you just can't get into the moment. Huh? Okay. Can I be a little crude? We don't have anybody really young in here, right? Can I be a little crude for a moment? Yeah, Can I be a little blunt? I'm going to talk to the ladies, right? It can be a little hard for ladies sometimes to get into the mood when there's crying kids in the other room. Huh? Am I wrong? I'm not thinking about a million things. I'm a million things. And you want me to think about this right now? Now, dudes, we don't care. Crying kids, the house is burning down, whatever. We just, yeah, we going. We good. I don't care. <laughs> I'm being crude. I get it. I know. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But I want to make the point, right? There's just some things, both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, that when the environment's not right, things just don't work. And it is the same with faith. It's the same with faith. There's sometimes that just a change of the environment can bring you greater faith, right? That's why a lot of churches do what's called healing lines. Healing lines creates an incubator or, or a greenhouse, an environment of faith. It's not that a pastor has any more power or anointing or access to God. That's total BS if anybody ever tells you they do. They do not. But what does happen is, we say, come to the front. When I lay my hands on you, you are going to be healed. What did that just do? It just created a moment of expectation. It creates a contact point for faith. When they touch me, I will be healed. It's just a contact point for faith. And Jesus is saying, I've got to get this guy out of this moment, out of this current environment, out of this current situation. Because I need to do something for him, with him, and through him that this current environment's not conducive for. Now, I've heard people say, well, he's God. He can do anything, anywhere, anytime. Let's, let's, look, at some, let's look at some scriptures. Mark 9, 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked his scribes, why are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowds, crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who, was mute, who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. They could not. Now, they've done this before. They've operated in miracles before. 
They've operated in gifts before. But in this current situation, in this specific moment, in this specific place, they could not. He answered, he said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? So he was expecting them to do what he taught them. He goes, guys, if I, I got to go away. I can't keep cleaning up your mess. How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has he been, this been happening to him? His father said, from his childhood. And often he has thrown both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on and help us. Jesus said to him, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You see, you can't be in faith and in doubt at the same time. You can't believe and be in doubt at the same time. It's one or the other. Either you believe or you don't. There's no such thing as partial belief. I have a little bit. I have a little bit of hope that this could happen. Then you don't believe. It's either you believe or you don't. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So look, let's just take a look at this. Like, there was a belief problem. There was a faith issue. It wasn't even so much that the disciples were doing anything wrong. We had to get the dad in the right place. We had to get the dad's faith in the right place. Come on, somebody, look, just read it, right? When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. The spirit cried out, convulsing him greatly, and came out. And he became as one dead. So the many said, oh, my Lord, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. He rose. See, there's factors. There's things that happen. There's environments where things are just a little bit harder to happen. we got to get faith in the right place. Why are we doing the stories of Jesus Why are we doing it in this summer series? Because I feel like there was an attack these last few years on faith. On faith. An attack on faith. I believe it's been very hard to believe and trust in God for things these last few years. Back here in this passage in Mark 9, 23. He's asked the question, what do you mean if I can? If I can, if I can believe, anything is possible if you believe. And I'm just, I'm just asking you to say, can, can you believe? Can, can you believe that Jesus is the same miracle working God even if you don't get the result the second you pray? Can you believe? Or can you only believe the result instantaneously? See, see that that's all right. Let me let me let me break this down a little bit more. Let me, let me ask this question. There are some people who are not very intelligent, who they believe going to the gym one time <laughs> is going to give them 19-inch biceps. And so they go to the gym one time, one time, and they're hurt, they're sore, they can't even rub their hair. And because they didn't get 19-inch biceps, I ain't going back, didn't work. Didn't work. But more intelligent people understand that it's the consistency of putting a demand on your body or putting a strain on a muscle over time that builds scar tissue that develops a muscle. Huh? So just because you did not get an instantaneous miracle does not mean that God did not start the healing process. See, but doubt can't come in. 
Doubt can't come in. Faith has to remain. Where healing is concerned, there has never been a shortage of God's power. There has never been a shortage of God's power. But apparently, according to Scripture, there are times where there's a shortage of faith. Now, we also understand that the Bible says that if you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you could speak to mountains and they'd be removed. So it's not even so much how much faith, it's just if you have faith or you don't. And I would dare say there's a lot of people who say verbally that they have faith, but it's really not faith. It's want. It's need. It's lust. Can there be, can there be that? Is that a wrong word? Greed. Wanting more from God. More, 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 more but not actually having faith for it? Because faith is actionable. Faith is actionable. Faith makes you move. Every single story that we've looked at, someone moved towards God. They weren't waiting for God to move towards them. I wonder what your move towards God needs to look like in your life. Because every single one of our journeys is different. Every single one of our stories is different. Come on. Faith being present in the environment determines if the power of God is able to flow the way that it is supposed to flow. And in our story that we're studying out, Jesus was like, I need to change environment. I need to move this guy away for whatever reason. For whatever reason. We could make a thousand stories. We can make a thousand stories, okay? So here's one. I'm going to make a total story up. I'm totally making this up. One of the friends that brought this guy is like a high codependent. And this is the person that takes care of him all the time, makes all his decisions. And so Jesus is trying to talk to this guy or sign language or get his attention, but this person just keeps talking over. Well, no, see, the reason is because, and this is because, and he's like, Jesus is like, shut up! I got to get away from you. You're actually part of the problem. Come on. There's a reason why I made that up, but there's a reason why Jesus had to pull this guy away from the environment and get him alone. Luke 5:17. And it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there was Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee. Man, they were ganging up. Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, who they sought to bring and lay before him. And when they could find no other way that they might bring him in through the crowd, they cut the roof off the house. Come on, you guys know the story. When they saw his faith, he says, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is he who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, <clears throat> your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go from your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed. They glorified God. They were filled with fear, saying, we have seen some strange things today. This is almost the same sort of situation. This man can't even get through a crowd. He can't get through the crowd. He can't be where, so Jesus is kind of in this small house trying to do these one-on-one -on -one ministries. 
These guys go out of their way. It's like, no, we need to get to Jesus. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. Taking that step of faith. And they drop him into this private house, into this private setting where Jesus can do a miracle. Okay? Let me ask you this question. Have you, has anybody in here ever tried to go to the hospital and pray for somebody at the hospital? It's probably the worst place to try to pray for somebody. It is. It's the hardest place to ever try to pray for somebody. Because they are just surrounded by doubt and unbelief. They're surrounded by misery. They're surrounded by doctors and nurses who are used to death. They're used to their medicine and their procedures failing and being sued for it. A little hard-hearted. It's a very, very hard place to pray for, pray for people. It's easier for us and it's better for us to not have to pray in that environment, but to take someone back to their house or to bring them to the church and anoint them with oil because people connect faith to environments. I'm going to throw this out there, just throwing this out. It's one of the reasons why we don't like to do a lot of funerals in this room. We prefer to do funerals at funeral homes because people connect that building to death. We want this building to be connected to life. And I get that people want those sort of things to happen <clears throat> in the house of God. Hey, but listen, wherever I go is the house of God. Whatever house I walk into, is the house of God. Whatever house Pastor John Mark walks into is the house of God. Come on, I'm just saying. I'm just throwing some, giving you some information. People connect emotion and, and then they end up not coming back to the church. Hey, well, I haven't seen you church. Every time I come in, I just see the casket with my loved one. It's just hard. Yeah. Same things with hospitals. People connect that emotion, those feelings, and there's doubt. There's unbelief. And it's very hard. You have to work harder to overcome that unbelief. There's a story in the Bible of Jesus doing a miracle for Jairus' daughter. Jesus had to change the environment. He had to get certain people in the room and out of the room. He had to move some things around because there was just some things affecting the moment. I, was just, I, I took a long time to build this up just to say you've got to get the right people surrounding you you got to get the right people praying for you. Mark 7, 33. He took him aside from the multitude. He put his fingers in his ears. He spat and he touched his tongue. Why did Jesus do that? I could not find an answer. Apparently the Holy Spirit let, the Holy Spirit let him to do that. Um, I think it gave us some, I think it gave Benny Hinn some good uh, material to do healing crusades. Later on, and <laughs> anybody ever seen Benny Hunt on TV do his healing things and spit on people and wave cloths? And people, yeah. I don't really know why he did it. There's no, there's no like medicinal purposes in spit to put in people's ears. I don't know. Obviously, the Holy Spirit led him to do it this way. But here's what I've learned. The moment you expect Jesus to do something a specific way, he ain't going to do it that way. The moment you try to put God in a box of how he's going to meet your need, he's not going to meet your need that way. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. All right? Mark 7, 34. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and he says, be opened. Notice in this story... Versus the story of the man being dropped through the roof. He did not say your sins are forgiven you. He did not cast out a deaf spirit. He spoke to the man's ears and he said be opened. Right? He spoke specifically to the problem. To the circumstance. So here at Family Church, when we lay hands on somebody and pray over their situation, we, we ask you what am I praying for? 
when people come up to me and say, oh, just unspoken, I can't do that. <laughs> unspoken prayer, okay, see ya. But no, it's unspoken, so I'm not going to say anything. If I don't know what I'm praying for, I got nothing to pray for. Come on, somebody. But you tell me what's going on, no judgment. I ain't going to judge you for what's going on in your life, but I got something to pray at. I got something to speak to. I got something to take authority over. I have a name to put on something. Come on, right? So he, he looks to heaven. He didn't look at the problem. He didn't look at the ailment. He didn't look at this sick person. He looked to heaven. I think too many of us as a sinner are looking at our problem, praying at our problem, instead of looking to heaven. Hmm. He speaks life and faith over the situation. And I'm going to ask this question, like, where's your attention? What's holding your attention? Is, is following your dreams and ambitions holding your attention? Or is failure, hurt, and pain holding your attention? Because whichever one holds your attention is where you're going to get stuck or where you're going to move toward. Everywhere Jesus looked in that environment, it was just sick people, sick people, sick people, sick people. He had to get this guy away and get his attention on his heavenly father. I'm just going to keep encouraging you. Maybe we've just given like the news too much attention. The economy, too much attention. The problems around us, too much attention. Instead of connecting with the Lord. Smith Wigglesworth, a great man of faith, was once called to the bedside of a woman that was at the threshold of death. He was there with six other ministers who each took turns praying over her. One prayed to comfort her husband. Another prayed to comfort her children. Smith Wigglesworth, in his heart, was praying for them to shut up. When it came time for his turn to pray for her, he had a vision of the face of Jesus over her bed. And when he prayed for the woman, she was miraculously healed and raised from the bed. After the woman was healed, the others present with Smith Wigglesworth said, when we prayed, she didn't get healed. Why did she get healed? When you prayed, Smith Wigglesworth replied, well, it's easy. You prayed looking at the dying woman. I prayed looking at Jesus. <laughs> what are your eyes on? Who are you surrounded with? Who are your eyes on? Who are you surrounded with? It matters who is around you. It matters who your friends are. If your friends and your family and your acquaintances are not, listen, mm, how do I say this in a life-giving way? No, you don't get to choose your family, but you do choose how long you hang out with them. None of us is stuck. None of us is stuck. Let me give you an encouragement. You have a maximum of 120 years to live. One chance to live this life, and God has trusted you to live that life with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. You choose. You choose who those people are around you, whether they're feeding into those good things or they're just absolutely draining all of it out of you. Choose wisely. I'm going to tell you this today, where you look determines where you're going to flow, where your anointing is going to be. Even Jesus had to get his attention in the right place. All right, the healing power of God worked through Jesus not because he was Jesus, but because he knew how to believe and how to connect with that belief. And we all have that. 
We all have that. Looking up to heaven, he sighed, he said, be opened, and his ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak. Jesus simply spoke to the man's ears, and they were opened. He did not cast out any demons. He spoke to the problem. He spoke to the situation. If there's something going on in your body, you have a diagnosis, you take medication for something, then every time you take that medication, listen, do what the doctors say. Take that medication and speak to that problem. Speak to that problem. I speak to this thyroid. I speak to cancer. I speak to this tumor. I speak to this nodule. I, I command it to leave my body in the name of Jesus. Right? And just like working out continually builds that muscle and it's that consistency, that prayer, every time you take that, it's going to eat away at it, eat away at it, eat away at it. Come on, you got to have that faith got to have that faith. And if you're sitting here, I tried that, then you never actually were in faith. You were trying an exercise, but weren't fully committed. Come on. A lot of us have tried fad diets, but we haven't changed our lifestyle of eating forever. We all know what we should do. The application of it's a little bit harder. Hmm. What are you focusing on in your life? Are you focused on problems or are you focused on Jesus? There needs to be a time and a space in your life when you get away from the things that are draining you so that you can hear from God. I'll tell you, for me, I just know me, I've got to either be out fishing or hiking or hunting. i got to be somewhere in nature. I'm going to help somebody today. I'm going to help somebody today. God gave us this beautiful earth. There's all sorts of energy and electricity that comes from the earth. Somebody, you just need to take your shoes off and your socks off. And go walk out in the grass and get grounded. Get grounded. Get connected with the nature that God gave us. Let the energy of the earth, and I'm not being weird. God gave us this. He gave us these bodies. We came from the dirt. Take a walk with no shoes on. Get grounded. Don't take your phone. Don't look at social media. Listen. Listen to the sound of the wind. Listen to the sound of the birds. Listen to the crickets. Listen to the frogs. Smell the air. Let the peace of God reign richly in your heart and your mind. And once a week, change environment. Get outside. Get out of the air conditioning. Sweat a little bit. And in a moment like that, when you're out there and there's nothing distracting you and you don't hear all this noise. If you've never asked this question, ask this question in your heart or out loud. God, do you love me? God, do you love me? Because if you don't know that God Almighty personally loves you, you're never going to operate in faith. You're not. Because you're never going to even believe to ask someone that you don't think loves you. Do you love me? And if you get a resounding yes, then I think you need to take that conversation one question further. Why do you love me? Why do you love me? And let him write that love letter on your heart in that moment. It can't be someone else's reason why. It can't be something that you heard someone else say. No, no, why do you love me? What is it about me that you love? And let your heavenly father tell you that. Don't try to make something up. Here. Be at peace. Let him speak to you. What's that going to do, Pastor Mike? I believe that if you understand that God Almighty loves you, 
and that you believe that he uniquely loves you for a specific reason different than mine. It's going to enhance your trust and your faith in him to go to him and make a request of things that you never would have. But for many of us, we need an environment change. We're not going to get that sitting at the office. We're not going to get that sitting on the couch watching Netflix. We're, we got to get away. This is the big thing that I want to show you in this passage, is that there's going to be moments of time that we need to get away with Jesus, away from the crowd, away from the noise, away from the kids, so that he could do a work in us that he could not do in a different environment. Father, we thank you today for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray that this sermon made sense. I hope that we, I hope that we can get this. That we need to take our eyes off the problem and put our eyes on the solution. Put our eyes on Christ the healer. And not just for healing, but for emotional issues, for financial issues. Speak to us, Lord. Guide us. Help us in our times of need. Give us wisdom in our times of championing. When we are winning and we're at the top of the mountain, give us wisdom on how to invest that, how to bank that. Be part of every moment of our lives, the mountaintops and the valley lows. Be there with us. Lord, I thank you today that this word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, I pray that we are blessed coming in, we'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.